Okay, let's start. So a couple of things. Uh, first of all, we posted our office hours, right? Uh, did you guys see them? Uh, like they are here on canvas. Uh, mine are today. Uh, Kasumi is Thursday at from two to three, and Jerry Friday from twelve thirty to one thirty, right? And they are also posted on a class web page. So if you need any help, please see us. Uh, I have a conflict today, so mine this week will be same time, but on Thursday. So right away after the lecture, you can head to my office, talk to me, uh, ask for help. Moreover, we're going to assign uh, our first homework today, right? It will be building shell and kind of getting uh, uh, getting ready to work with GDB, right? GDB is our the thing which helps us to debug programs. So it's the default debugger on, on, on Unix systems, right? Um, any questions as of now? Any questions about the class or anything? Well, so, I guess your question is like, how will you work on your homework, right? Which machines you're gonna use, right? So this homework can be done on virtually on any machine which supports POSIX interface. So it can be Mac, can be Linux. We support CAD machines, right? So we ask you to create a CAD account if you don't have it and you try to work there. It might be convenient or inconvenient, depending on how you, depending on your setup, right? So if like, uh, but okay, like just let's take it slow and, and try to figure out. So, I mean, it's hard for me to, to give you a good advice. So I do a lot of work remotely, right? So all my work is in some data centers, right? And so I don't even run anything on my laptop anymore. Like occasionally I, I try to build, but it's usually harder to build locally than set it up there. So I'm I'm used to that. So, but again, maybe not everyone is finds it uh, extremely uh, convenient. On Windows, you can do this homework by installing Windows Subsystem for Linux WSL. So it it used to work for me when I was running Windows like like a couple of years ago. It was kind of decent, so it should work as well. So it's a virtual machine on Windows. Windows. Linux virtual machine on Windows, which is well supported, let's put it this way, right? Uh, again, uh, maybe uh, we'll try to do some recommendations for how to set up the tooling. Just maybe I will spend some time um, on, th on Thursday to advertise a couple of options for how this can be done. Uh, any, any other questions? There was a hand there. Okay. okay. So, but Kate is our thing which we're gonna support for the class, meaning that if you have issue, we're gonna go and debug on Kate. But uh, if you really have issue with your Windows or, or Mac setup, we're gonna help you as well. We'll try. Yeah, it might, but it becomes a little unusual, right? But let's do it with you. Uh, okay, cool. So back to the lecture. Uh, and uh, so let's quickly finish. Okay, the plan for today is the following. We will quickly finish the operating system interface interfaces lecture, right? So again, the the main idea uh, which you have to learn from this is this interface which uh, uses fork and exact to create programs. And while it's a very unusual way to create things, right? It works. And uh, I mean, it became, historically it became successful, right? Because it lasted for 50 years and we're still running it. We'll discuss briefly the limitations in a moment, right? And second, so essentially you, you have to understand how fork exact work and you have to understand how file descriptors and IO redirection works, right? That's kind of the core of this Unix interface, right? And, and that's why the, the shell assignment will teach you, like essentially ask you to, okay, demonstrate this knowledge. You kind of, at a high level, you understand how this, these things work, right? But then uh, let's code it. Uh, code it up to make sure that we all understand that we can use this interface. And then we will start a new lecture in which uh, in which I will introduce x86 assembly. 
And uh, I will explain why, like if maybe it's too early to motivate it now. So let's just wait for 10 minutes and finish this one first. Okay, so we looked at fork and exact, right? And this is the main thing why they designed it this way, right? So they said, okay, look, uh, uh, we want to have a little bit of control uh, between we started the program or cloned ourselves and between we replace the memory of the program with, with completely new image, right? So it's kind of like, uh, you know, you have a tiny script which you can execute before the program runs, right? So when you, you fork yeah. yourself, you're still in control. It's your code which is running and then you execute exact and uh, the memory of the program gets replaced completely, right? So this idea is clear, right? So that's the main motivation for this uh, couple. Exact and forth, right? Okay, so uh, this was our main motivating example. So we essentially wanted to say, okay, we want to build as pipelines because shell is a simple but programming language and we want to combine existing tools uh, in, a, in this data flow style computation, right? So essentially cat uh, produces something and re redirect output of cat to the input of grab and then we redirect uh, output of grab to the input of WC, right? Uh, and uh, my whole thing, which I was trying to explain now for two weeks was the, okay, how this will work, right? So essentially it works through this mechanism of a pipe, right? And I explained what pipe is. Remember, it's a, it's a small buffer which sits in, in the memory of the operating system kernel. Uh, it has limited capacity in case of XV6, it's only 512 byte. And essentially what we're doing here, we are creating a pipe, right? In the parent, because that's the only way to introduce it to the child, right? Because if you try to create it later, the parent will never learn about it. You cannot pass a file, dis like, like a file descriptor across in this system, right? So you can only, if the parent creates it, child can inherit it, right? So then you fork and then you do this manipulation. You say, you're saying, well, We'll attach one end of the pipe to the standard output, specifically uh, the left uh, side of the pipe, right? And we attach the standard input to the right side of the pipe, right? To make sure that they are connected. So let's take a look at, uh, uh, at the example code which does it, right? So it's a small piece of code which essentially attaches double you see on the read end of the pipe, right? So here, line three, we first create a pipe. Remember, we discussed a little bit why create system call is not a good match because pipe has to return two file descriptors, right? It's a little hard to return a tuple in C. I mean, it's not that it's hard. It's just that uh, the only way you can do it is, or multiple ways, but one way to do it is just to say, look, in practice, the pipe system call will create uh, will take a point will take a pointer to an array of two integers. Integers are file descriptors. Remember, they're just numbers. Okay, so pipe will fill in this array. I mean, ideally, I should check for an error here, right? But I don't. Or whoever wrote this code, not me, I guess. And then you start forking. You say, look, if I I fork and I am inside the child, right? So what I'm doing, I'm Closing the file descriptor zero. And I'm using another system call, which is called to dupe, which is which stands for duplicate, right? So it duplicates the uh, zero, the file descriptor, which I pass here from the uh, array P into which file descriptor? How dupe will work? Zero. Into zero. Why? Because uh, according to the, the FD allocation, uh, it will begin to uh, allocate the first FD. Uh, I'm using FD since uh, zero is very close, so it's the first available file descriptor for the next. Correct. So look, so if I if I start drawing the picture, so line three creates a pipe, right? Uh, pipe will have two ends. To me, these ends are vis visible as P0 and P1, right? Yes. And 
despite I'm in a child, my file descriptor table is, is same as in a parent, right? So if it looks like this, my file descriptor table, and there is a file descriptor zero here, which was my uh, yeah standard input. So like probably I should rather do it on this side, right? So because if like if WC will be running here, so let's just make the drawing a little bit a little bit more clear here. No. So inside my WC, my standard input points to most likely console. We don't know for real, but let's assume, right? So what I'm doing here, I'm closing zero. So this one become pointing nowhere. And my P0 is one of these. I don't know which number, maybe it's three, maybe it's four, right? So essentially I'm saying a duplicate. So this is this is where P0 is pointing. And I'm duplicating it here. And this is actually pointing to this. Uh, uh, read end of the pipe. Agree? After this manipulation. So I'm attaching to the pipe like this. Then I do a couple of uh, important things here. So I'm closing P0 and P1. So why is that important? Because the child will never write to them. Okay, let me let me grab a piece of space here, like, like for example here. So imagine we have a pipe, right? Uh, imagine we we created a pipe, right? Imagine uh, that was P zero and this one P one. And uh, P0 was pointing to this end of the pipe. P1 was pointing to this. And uh, uh, we duplicated zero, which points now here as well, right? Yes. So inside the parent, our high level goal inside the parent is to make sure that one will be connected to this end of the pipe, right? And again, there will be those ends, P0 and P, P0 will be pointing here, P1 will be pointing here. Already confusing, right? At, at high level, level, in the future, our goal is to have a pipe which is only like this, which looks like this, right? Everything is, is closed. This is file descriptor one, which is connected to this end. And this is file descriptor zero, which is connected to the, this end, right? Yeah. And at some point, this, let's say, left side of the pipe is writing something in a pipe, and the right end of the pipe mm -hmm. is reading something from a pipe, right? Yes. The question which I will ask, how we will detect that the left end is done? So imagine it has, uh, it has something to write. In our example, it will be hello world. But uh, then, we have to say, well, that's it. We will never get anything from that pipe again. So how is it done? After the buffer is consumed, also the left the end is closed. We can make sure no one else will write into the buffer. Correct. So what you said is that it's important to, to make this, uh, to construct this pipe in such a manner that when the left, when the writer from the left, right, exits and essentially this end of the pipe is closed when we read everything from the pipe and pipe becomes empty the operating system will return us an error code saying okay it's done right mm -hmm. if you suddenly forget to close those ends of the pipe because you clone them and they're still pointing to let's say here one of them is pointing here you will never detect it because the pipe in the operating system kernel will say, well, there is still one potential writer. The, I'm, I'm not closed yet. And if you go into the kernel and say, let's read a little bit more data, you will stuck there forever, right? Because the right end of the pipe is still open. So that's why it's super critical to close them. 
and make sure that they are closed because otherwise you will, you will like when you build your shell, you say, look, I cloned, I did everything with the pipe, but my process never exits. Like for example, WC, which sits on the right side of the pipe is trying to read the information from a pipe indefinitely, right? Because there is an open end of the pipe, which the operating system says, okay, well, you can potentially write into that pipe, right? Um, so you've written file descriptions. Is the same file descriptions, or are they actually separate? Like... Right. So okay. So the question is, I I did it here, right? In this in this picture. Uh, let me. If I. So if this is the left side. And this is the right side. In our case, right side as the child, right? So this this code of the child, right? So this is a file descriptor of a child, and this is a file descriptor of a parent. So there, there's the two tables in the kernel. They might uh, those file descriptor might have different logical numbers. Like maybe this one is seven, and this one is eleven, for example. But they inside the kernel they point to the same file descriptor. And they, inside the kernel, the kernel will be counting how many readers and writers are still open. So it will implement this re reference counting discipline. And it will say, I will only report an error from the read end of the pipe when I know that the number of writers is zero and nothing else will ever be written to that pipe. Otherwise, it will just be waiting for more information. You drop into a pipe, you say, well, I want to read. And maybe the, the writer is just slow. Maybe it's doing something, but maybe write eventually, right? So that's the deal. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, so this is obviously a very simple version of what to do if you want only one uh, type of thing. Uh, and you're kind of doing the rest of this, I'm assuming it's in the shell, like the else statement, that's still running in the shell, code, right? Well, here, uh, the shell will, will be a little bit more complicated because right. in the shell, you will have to support recurring because you say, look, what if I say pipe? Like, what if my command line has exactly. two pipes? Yeah. So this is this example is is a yeah simplified because it's still a language and it recursively do that. But I guess for the left and the right side, you would do sequential ports. Right. Uh, right. That was kind of the main thing. That was one right. Of right. So but I'm not I'm not telling you how to build a shell. I'm just illustrating a general pattern of uh, okay. what you need to encode in that shell, but shell would require recursion. Like for example, uh, I forgot to, like we have a set of examples, but your shell should support something like uh, pipes, combination of uh, IO redirects and stuff like that, right? So you have to, it becomes a little bit tricky and you have to twist your brain a little for how to support, how to fork recursively. But let's just understand how so the simplest example. Uh, I was thinking that I should will not be talking about it, to be honest. Okay. So, but uh, is that uh, okay? That's a good question. So, shall we or shall we not? I never did, but uh, like, let's uh, let's start working on a homework, sure. and then we will we'll see like how to support this recursion. Yeah. So the homework assignment, uh, it helps you a little bit. Maybe I will write a little bit more to like to illustrate, like like I say, to give you a hint for how to build it, build this recur recursion. There are different ways to do it, right? So, because it's just programming at this point. Okay, but what I wanted to like, I wanted to make sure that we close those ends of the pipe, right? Uh, and uh, and later on we just say exact into WC. We created those argument arguments for WC, the WC itself, and it takes no arguments in our case. So we just uh, put the second argument as zero. And inside the parent, we say, okay, cool. Well, just write this string into the into the uh, right hand of the pipe, right? So, and again, I'm like this code simplifies it a little bit. So it, it just uses P1 directly and writes into it and then closes both of them. Uh, so 
Maybe a cleaner example would be, again, fork here one more time and then redirect uh, standard input into the P1 end of the pipe and then do, do something more similar to, to this part, right? But at the high level, that's the pattern. So question, good. Again. Uh, how it's implemented, I honestly don't know. So dupe two, just uh, uh, no idea. This is, I mean, again, my goal is to, I simplify everything a little bit. So this is, uh, this is the very minimal interface which x 6 implements, and this is what it provides. I encourage you to code in this style for this homework assignment, just, just because this way it will be easier for you to understand what's going on later in the x 6 kernel. There was another question. In this example, in the first half or the second, uh, okay, let me just raise everything here. So originally, imagine you're before executing this line, right? Your file descriptor table uh, let's imagine for simplicity because we can imagine that we started from main and nothing extra was open. So you have three file descriptors open, zero, one, and two. Standard input, standard output, and standard error. I think they all, like again, for simplicity, although it's not uh, like set in stone, because maybe someone started us differently, right? But imagine no one did any IR redirection. They all point to the console. And the console is this uh, device driver, which outputs something on the screen, on the, like, on the terminal and reads from the keyboard, right? Then we execute the pipe line okay the operating system creates a pipe inside the kernel and the zero is the points here to the read end of the pipe let's say this is the read and this one points to the right end of the pipe right and your array p will contain those numbers three and four, right? Because uh, four will be here and three will be here. I got it right, right? Agree? Okay, that's your file descriptor table and nothing else is opened. Then you say, okay, I'm gonna fork here. And suddenly fork itself duplicates this file descriptor and it's absolutely identical, right? So it's again, zero, one, two, three, and four. Right? Now I'm gonna not gonna draw the errors just to simplify the picture, but they are the same, right? At this point you say, okay, let's close zero. Zero used to point to the console, right? So it will be pointing to nowhere for a second. Then we say duplicate the P0 descriptor. Remember, since the whole memory is copied, you will have P0 in both the parent and the child, right? So if I separate their other spaces, there will be the same P in both the parent and the child. And you say, well, I passed P0, so must be that uh, if uh, this four is pointing, uh, ah, uh, bop, bop, bop. did I get it wrong? Mm, P0, is, P0 is three, right? Sorry, so let me, just fix the picture here. P0 is three, this is four, this is three, this is four. So we're gonna go here again and we'll say P0 three is pointing to read end of the pipe. And since we're duplicating it, the operating system will find the first unopened file descriptor. And in our case, it's this zero, right? And so it will become connected like this, right? At this point, we say, look, since four is still pointing here, 
we're going to close them all false, so essentially crossing out this and this end, right? That's inside the child. And so right now, this one, one is still pointing to the console, two is pointing to the console as well, but standard input is pointing to the pipe, to the read end of the pipe. And when you execute, then you, you exec, obviously this memory disappears. You start from the main of WC, right? So you start running main of WC, but the file descriptor stays the same, right? So when WC says read from zero, it will try to read from the pipe, agree? And on this end, you say, look, I'm like, I'll execute a simpler sequence. So I'll be just writing into P1. P1 is four. So I will be writing into the right end of the pipe. And then I immediately close P0 and P1, which is probably like, it's kind of necessary if you start, if you keep running here forever, but if you exiting, you don't have to because the, file, the, the operating system will anyway close everything what you opened, right? But just to emphasize this argument, we say that, okay, since we're closing both P0 and P1, when, and inside the pipe, this hello world is written, when WC reads everything from standard input, at some point, it will consume all the hello world, will come back to read more. It sees that, okay, there are no writers open, and it will return with a specific error. And remember, if I show you here quickly uh, the actual implementation of uh, WC and in XV6, so this is what it will do. So it says, okay, I'm reading something. So I don't know if it's uh, big enough. I'm reading something from the file descriptor. I have a pre-allocated buffer. And uh, the moment I'm... The moment I'm reading... Uh, so what I'm talking about. Uh, what I wanted to show you is the is the pop, 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 is the error condition from the from the pipe, right? So what is that pipe returns? Uh, let's just take a look at the pipe. So inside X was six as well. So yeah, ah, why is that? Wait, is it always like that, or just today? Uh, we stopped your coding earlier. Just this very last. One. Uh, Okay, let me share again. Sorry. Thank you for I share screen. Okay. And that's the one. Okay, let's try again. Nope. Well, PowerPoint is a powerful thing. So <laughs> So if I probably, maybe I can swap this place. Yeah, then I will probably be able to see. No, wow, not like that even. Um, then I have to swap again. Uh, okay, let's, uh, if I stop sharing for a sec. So what I wanted to show you here is this. Uh, um, so essentially it returns zero exactly on uh, this is a file which implements pipe in or the read read method of a pipe in X with six. So what it does is that uh, there is this, and I will explain it later again. So it does, uh, it tracks of this read and write pointers. If there is nothing in a pipe, it just goes to sleep and waits for something to be uh, written into a pipe. And then essentially what it does here, okay, probably not a good, not a good, not a good way to understand it. Okay. Yeah. So, but anyway, so just let's let's stick to the main figure, the main to the main uh, 
uh, line here. Uh, then I have to somehow get to the screen. And... The point is that uh, uh, the moment you finish reading from an empty pipe, it will return you like zero inside WC and it will correctly say, okay, I'm done. Okay, question. Which line, line 10? Well, why do you have to close P0? Correct. So technically speaking, you might say you don't have to because uh, Yeah. Right, so it will work. So it will work if you if you comment out this line, the whole thing will work because, in fact, as I was saying, you you can comment out both of those, right? Uh, no, you have to actually leave uh, leave this one, right? Because if you if you keep running, if you if you exiting here saying okay, I'm exiting the program, then it's fine. So at this point, it will be be closed. Uh, automatically, but uh, here probably giving this example without cl closing P zero is a little is a little odd. So, but it will work. You're right. But, uh, yeah, I think this is. Uh, uh, I would prefer to at the beginning to close the P zero because uh, from this program in the current process, it does not want to read anything from the pipe. So. For my view, I think. <laughs> yeah. Right. So what you're saying is that uh, you can, uh, but you cannot close it. Sorry, you cannot. Cancel. Uh, sorry, I probably clicked something. Uh, you cannot move it here, right? Because. If you close it Before here, the, yeah. inside the parent process, but you can you can yeah. you can move it up here. That's one. Yeah, but again, probably doesn't change the yeah. the perception of this code by a lot. Okay, are we done? So we understood this example. Just again, spend a little more time that more than I expected. So that's again my illustration for this. Uh, but we already kind of drew all the pipes, so we understand how it works, right? Uh, Okay, so as I was saying, it turned out historically that this combination of fork and exact was a successful choice for them. It lasted for a while. Uh, however, so today people are kind of unhappy about fork and exact. So if I ask you a question, why do you think, uh, what is wrong essentially? Why you might be unhappy with, with, this, with this design? Can simply just execute a process instead of working first, or it, it kind of sounds like it has a lot of overhead because that's two different things to get one goal. Right. So reason number one, overhead. Imagine this pipe and like this fork and exact thing was designed to do IR redirection. How often you do that? You do it only when you really like deal with the shell. Well, what if you don't deal with the cell, right? And you really just want to create a new process. Then you say, okay, look, since in order to create a process, I am anyway, I have to execute a fork, right? Because otherwise I'm, I'm dying, right? So like you have to do it. And only then execute exact. The question is like how much time fork takes, right? If I ask you this question, like it's, it's kind of a design challenge so, or a design riddle. So you have an idea, so how long it will take to execute fork? You have to make a copy before... Correct. So what you're saying, you have to copy virtual memory because you know you are like you cloning, right? So it's okay. So and if I ask you a question, how long it might take? Let's say in cycles. 
hard to say, but let's imagine like you you have to, I mean, we don't know much about how you implement virtual memory, right, yet, but imagine you have this page table, which I was talking about, copying the entire page table will take you tens of thousands of cycles, right? Probably more than just one tenth. And then you exact and you throw it away. So you say, well, what if I really want to create small, fast processes, right? Mm -hmm. Which do something, I don't know, send a network packet and don't, don't do anything else. Okay, they said, okay, we, we, we have two optimizations in mind. First, do this lazily. So do a lazy copy. And like they later on came up with the trick when you touch a page, it's called a copy and write. It triggers a page fold, goes into the kernel, kernel copies a page. I will explain later how it works. It's okay, it optimizes a lot. They also came up with a special version of this uh, fork, which doesn't copy anything, but just allows you to kind of immediately execute exact, right? But it's still, and it's okay, but it's still, and it probably works, but it becomes clumsy, a little clumsy. Uh, question. I believe uh, I read this somewhere that even invoking a system called like has so much overhead because you'd have to switch over into the kernel from the user side and you have to get all that stuff running. Correct, but this is calls are reasonably fast in modern hardware, oh. only 100 cycles. It's not ideal. It used to be slower, but it's it used to be, let's say, in order of 500 cycles. Now it's 100, so it's relatively fast. So CPU designers actually came back and said, okay, well, we understand the need, we will optimize it. Uh, but still, this is, the, this is the problem. And the second problem is kind of more conceptual. What if I don't have a VM? Like, what if I don't have virtual memory altogether? Uh, for example, I built my operating system and it doesn't assume any page table or anything like that. It's possible. Then for me to implement a backward compatible interface, it becomes almost, imp almost impossible because you say, look, remember that this array, which we discussed just a second ago, P, which contains this number three and four, I somehow have to copy it inside the child, right? So it has a copy of three and four. And somehow imagine there is a, a pointer pointing to this array. I don't know, pointer R. And this array was at a specific memory address. If you don't have virtualization of memory on, on your hardware, then making sure that all pointers point to this array, all pointers in your, in your programs, like you have maybe one, maybe you have multiple, right? Becomes tricky. And you say, look, but meaning that I cannot even implement this interface. So a good example, maybe you're running something on top of a, like inside your web browser, you're using WebAssembly, for example, for isolation, right? Possible, but there is no virtualization of address spaces or like it becomes non-trivial. And uh, at this point you say, look, like the whole idea of copying the address space, it just works against me. Right, because I cannot achieve backward compatibility. And so the programs have to be changed, right? And people really deal with this on, on a daily basis, like today. Uh, I actually, there is this uh, interface, which like I, I did it multiple times where we like, we had to like deal with, uh, with the problem of what to do with for. And uh, if I ask you a question, so, okay, we got those problems. How will we design a similar interface, but avoiding this cloning of the other space, but an interface which would allow us to somehow implement IO redirection? What can be this design? So we still want to implement shell, but we don't want to, we, we just want to put it in a single, I don't know, like either single exact or single something, let's call it create or process create. system call. How can we achieve similar semantics? Yeah. Correct. So what you say is that, look, one of my arguments here will be maybe an array in which I somehow can specify which file descriptors have to be copied from me to, to a child, right? Mm -hmm. 
you lose a little bit of a flexibility. So maybe you really have to do some funky operations on like uh, on input and output file descriptors, but maybe you can achieve it with some combination of flags on this array and say that copy this one, but don't copy the next one, do like stuff like that, right? Because in practice, most of your, like most of the beauty of fork and exact goes just into IR redirection, implementing IR redirection. You don't do often anything else there. And so you can encode it here. So it's kind of like uh, if you know programming languages, it's imperative versus declarative. So this 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 is a declarative style. You have a declarative language where say, okay, I describe how I want to change the state of my my probe, right? specifically our file descriptor table. And imperative means I will actually provide code which runs and that will will does those changes, right? Like like we've seen before with on fork and exact, right? So, and this is where we are today. So like, it was extremely successful, but today it becomes a little cumbersome. And you can imagine like, just because it's, it lies on, runs on the assumption that you have virtualization of memory. And I mean, also I kind of told you that virtualization of memory is good and it's so convenient, right? And we will come back to it and study the page tables, but just keep in mind that when you really build code for really tiny devices, like which consume minimal power, there is just no way to to have a page table just because it just consumes power and you cannot like you run out of battery. So it's devices which are embedded sensors or something like that, right? Okay, so that's my that's my discussion, which I wanted to like to make sure that we understand as well. Okay, any questions about fork exact? But we still live with it, unfortunately. So, so you mean the Linux uh, softcal still uses the Right. Mm -hmm. So Linux uh, has all of it. That's why I say you can build this homework on every on every Linux or Unix machine because they all implement this interface, which became later became standardized as POSIX, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but again, there are my point is that we maybe at this point it makes sense to to move on and move beyond POSIX, right? Okay, just to finish it, so. Uh, let's take a look at a couple of other system calls which are there. Uh, we kind of know how we manage file descriptors, stuff like that. Uh, exit is a system call which terminates the process, right? If you think about it, you need it, right? Uh, it's always hidden from you. You never invoke exit explicitly normally when you do your programming assignments, right? But it's there in ellipse, right? And so on x 6 you actually have to invoke it explicitly if you want to be done. Uh, another system code is wait. Remember I said that if the fork uh, says, okay, cat uh, large file, large file txt, cat starts printing right like crazy. And so inside the shell, you say, look, it makes sense for me to wait for the cat to finish, right? And only after that, I'll put the new common prompt, right? Otherwise, it will be overwritten like this, right? I agree? Again, that's another example. You will see it in your shell. If you don't wait for your children, you will lose, a, lose your common prompt because you say, I printed it, but we were running concurrently and the child kept running and over, like printed over it, right? And so wait essentially will wait for any children of that process. So if you created multiple children and you say wait, and there is a child which exited, the operating system will return you a process identifier of the child, right? So you might call wait multiple times. That's totally fine. They might return out of order because you don't really know when when processes will, each of them will exit, right? Good. Okay, so that's uh, process management. Uh, a little bit about creating files. So we've seen open already, right? So open with a create flag, will create a new flag, file, an empty one. You can explicitly create a directory. And a directory uh, at the level of a file system, it's a special file, which at the level of a file system is maintained as a file, but it, essentially what it has inside is just an array of uh, a, a file name, a string, and the second element is an inode number. So it will connect uh, names to inodes, and inodes are representation of files at the level of a file system. This make node, it's again, it's a little bit archaic. So it allows you to create a new device, a file which, which you can later open. And there is a special scheme which uh, creates a mapping between 
the something what is called a major and minor numbers, which essentially identify a device. So for example, in X plus six, console has a major, major number of one. So you, can, you say, uh, create a file, which is called a console and attach it to device number one. And later on operating system, when you read from that file, you will really get to the console and read from the, from the keyboard, for example. Right. So we will take a look at how it's done later, but just, just make sure like, and the reason I saying it's a little ar archaic, like this encoding of numbers to devices. I mean, how many numbers can you remember? Well, not many, right? So in a modern world, you can, can imagine that you would probably say, look, I will enumerate a bus. Remember I was drawing a bus and maybe like, this, this infrastructure can just give a, uh, real human readable names to each device. Maybe each device has a unique like uh, identifier anyway on that bus. So you can like access them like that. But this is this is how they did it back then. Fstat gives you information about the file, for example, like size uh, and number of times it's actually linked from a file system, meaning that uh, it shows up in multiple directories, for example. Uh, and this is this leads us to this idea of a link. So link is a creating a new symbolic name. So for example, physically you might have one file, but you might put it in two different directories and give it different names. And uh, that's essentially this mechanism of a link. Unlink is the opposite of link. So for example, how you use those. So here you say, uh, I want to create a temporary file. So you say, you give it a name, like convention TMP, is a folder where you keep temporary files. You give it a random name, X, Y, Z. You say, create, read and write permissions, and immediately unlink, meaning that this entry uh, in a file system is deleted, right? But you still have a file descriptor. So the file will remain there for as long as the file descriptor is open. But when you exit or close this file descriptor, the operating system will garbage collect this file underneath, right? So that's a trick. And then finally, like our main conclusion from this lecture, which is kind of beautiful, is that uh, this the set of system calls which X plus six implements fits on one screen. Again, if you you know typically when you start reading something like a POSIX standard, good luck. I mean, it will take you days. I mean, do I know it? No. Uh, some people probably know it. Uh, the point is that it's 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 very powerful that uh, you can really uh, run almost everything. I mean, maybe besides GUI and besides the network stack, right? But most of the programs you can imagine can be implemented with the set of system calls, right? And uh, and again, there is only like they fit on one screen, so like almost everything can can be implemented, right? So we only skipped a couple of here. So we say we didn't talk about kill. So which terminates a process, uh, return the current process ID, sleep will allow you to sleep for a number, n number of clock ticks. Huh? This one is important, SBRK, set bracket. So this one allocates memory actually. So it says, okay, my heap, and you start with a heap of size zero, you advance it by n. So you say it will plus one megabyte, for example, to my heap. And then your memory allocator runs off this memory. Or you can deallocate memory saying as BRK negative number, and you give memory back to the operating system. For you, it's hidden by the memory allocator by malloc. But malloc internally will use this as BRK and we'll take a look at how it's implemented. So we've seen all of these. Uh, that's it, right? So again, and uh, so. This is an exercise in designing those interfaces. Imagine I ask to build a new one and you start from zero. You think, okay, what is that I need to implement? Those guys did pretty well. Remember, we've seen them in the beginning of this lecture sitting at this PDP 11 or whatever they were running. And this interface survived. Right now it got extended to maybe like Linux probably implements around 250 system calls. Uh, not everything was possible in this set, but still, for many embedded systems, that 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 was a sufficient interface. And again, uh, another conclusion which I wanted to make is that in many in many ways, this X 6 is similar 
to the operating systems we run today. So same architecture, same idea for how you structure the kernel, major subsystems, structure processes, heaps, stacks, everything, right? Uh, and it's there for like 50 years. So if we look at this tree of operating systems, so X with six, like remember Ken Thompson, Dennis Ritchie on that first uh, uh, photo, X with six, like there were like Unix version zero, one, two, three, five, six, right? And then from here, different forks happen. So for example, if we care about something like Mac OS, so it first, uh, first this Unix, got forked by Berkeley a software distribution. So it's essentially, they were trying to build a, a better commercial Unix. And then later on, there is like, there was this intermediate step, next step OS. And essentially this to Darwin, which is an open version of Mac OS and Mac OS are running on top of this BSD kernel plus, plus a micro kernel, which runs underneath. So BSD, free BSD itself, which is still around, it was forked from BSD to make it really royalty free so people can use it for free. Uh, something like Linux was forked by Linux Torvalds. Uh, really, so there is no direct fork. So he didn't borrow any of the code. He This means that he borrowed the ideas from like how to build similar systems, but started from scratch. And of course, Linux became a default data center OS today, right? And also provides the uh, foundation for this uh, Android ecosystem. And so essentially, we started roughly here, 1970. We're still here roughly 50 years, right? So still running the same OS. There are, again, advantages and disadvantages. There's a lot of disadvantages that we're still in this family. Right, but still. And there is a bunch of operating systems which you never heard of because back then, operating system was kind of like, uh, I don't know, a machine learning framework or some machine learning or like AI model. They didn't know really what's, which one will win. Everyone was trying to participate in that game. So a bunch of those commercial systems like SunOS, Solaris, HPUX, right? So they existed and they were offered to customers, right? The, later on became less popular, but that's the story. And uh, another interesting observation that Utah was actually always in this ecosystem. So this is a photo from this 1984 summer, which is summer and there's still snow here. I think it's Snowbird or Brighton, I'm not exactly sure, but uh, uh, if you carefully read about this picture, you will see some people who are like, Professors today and some 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 are retired. Those those are the guys who build those systems, and uh, I mean, again, Utah was uh, at the core of it, right? So, like some contributions from Utah people got uh, into FreeBSD, and now if you grab through macOS uh, kernel, you will find those names. The guy is still there and in in MEB sitting. So you Mike Hibbler, so you can find him as well. Okay, cool. So this is the real end of this lecture. So we got the point. We understand what interface operating system is implementing. We understand this yellow part, which is the kernel, right? So it provides us interface. It reasonably it, it is, it is very small, fits on one screen, but yet very, very powerful as well. Now, since we're done with this one, and that's a success, we will move to our next lecture which is uh, an introduction to an x86 assembly. So if I ask you a question, why do we need to understand this? What will be the answer? So, okay, let me ask you differently. We spent, that's our week three, right? What do you think is the next lecture? What it should be about? What is it we have to learn to understand what a operating system is? The hint assembly is an intermediate step to something, to next, to what we really have to learn. Hardware. Hardware. Con connect to the hardware. Okay, we need to connect to the hardware, agree. But, uh, or more specifically, we need to understand what does it mean to run a program on the hardware? Right? Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of a black box, right? So we have compilers and we have already operating systems like I'm running this one, right? You yeah. will use Kate for your homework. You can code against this operating system interface, but you don't, you kind of, 
we have to get to the bottom of it and understand what does it mean to run something on a hardware. And our high level plan will be do this lecture on assembly to understand like what is that compilers generate? What really runs on the hardware? Then we will do a lecture on how the system boots. Now, hold on. We're going to do a lecture on how what's inside the process, right? Because we say, look, we got the machine instructions, addition, subtraction, stuff like that. If we want to run them, we need stack, heap, stuff like that. So we need linking and loading as well. So we will understand that. And then we understand how the system boots on the real hardware, right? And from there, we will start building a kernel. So we have a, we'll have a lecture, what happens from the, I press the power button and we get to the main of your kernel, right? The first line in your kernel. And then inside that main, we'll be building some memory management, synchronization, start multiple CPUs, bits of scheduling, bits of memory management and file system, right? And at that point, you, you kind of know everything. So, but that's the, kind of the outline for the entire end of the semester, right? Uh, but we'll start with this intermediate steps. So essentially, we need to understand getting to, like, in order to be able to understand what's inside the program, we need to understand how machine, how computer executes programs, right? Okay, good. Reasonable. Okay, my favorite slide. So what is inside the CPU? How do we actually execute programs? We execute instructions. We execute instructions. We really spoke about this a while ago. It's just a continuous loop of touching instructions, and putting that instruction, and executing them. So it's continuous way to. Correct. So what you're saying is that the interface of this machine, which we're running today, is very simple. It will just be running in a loop, executing instructions one by one. There will be a special register which points to memory. Memory is large. And so we can put our program in memory. And then this machine will be essentially getting one instruction after another from memory and executing them. And so, yeah, I did talk about it. So just a reminder. So there is this fetch, decode, execute loop, right? So everything starts from instruction generation. So instru instruction pointer or instruction address generation. So there is a special register, which is called instruction pointer, right? And uh, it points, it just contains an address in memory. This is memory, which contains the instruction which CPU will try to execute, right? So very first thing, it will try to fetch this instruction from memory. It means that maybe like this part, this on the left is silicon. So it actually a bunch of gates, very fast, cycle by cycle, right? And this is a different, also very fast, but they are connected by a bus, right? And so it takes some time to get this instruction here. And the CPU doesn't really know what is it, what's the next instruction is. So it, you, it first fetches it, then it tries to understand which one is that. So it just will look at the encoding of this addition, for example, and say, it's okay, it's an arithmetic addition, right? On, on a couple of registers. Then it will do a register read, like kind of an intermediate, intermediate step in a pipeline, read those values from registers into something what is called an LEU, right? Which will, a piece of logic, which will actually perform the addition, right? And then it will actually perform the addition itself, right? It's very high level. So you all took the class on computer architecture, I hope, and some of you were with me, and we looked at how we built pipelines specifically for MIPS CPUs. They're so simple that you can understand how they work, right? And uh, what happens next, you say, well, maybe there was an exception, like maybe this instruction was an interrupt and you're trying to invoke a system call. And then you will go here and start executing this exception handling code. Maybe this inter this instruction was a division and you were trying to divide by zero, right? Uh, and division by zero is undefined, right? Really, there is no such number that you can multiply by zero and get the number you were dividing, right? So again, execute this. Maybe you're trying to do a memory access and you're accessing a page or a region in memory which is not mapped in your page table, right? So again, exception, right? Like a sec fault. But maybe not. 
And then you say, look, everything is good. We can write back those computed value here. We can write it back in memory, in, in register RDX. And we essentially move on and say, what's the next instruction we're going to execute? Because Maybe it was an instruction which jumps somewhere else in the program. Maybe it's a loop and it jumps back or jumps forward if it's like an if stem statement, right? And normally it will be just instruction pointer plus the size of this instruction. On x86, instructions are of different size. Some can be one byte, some can be large, like eight bytes, for example, right? Five is a typical as well. And you say, look, okay, maybe it's just next instruction. So we will... We'll move instruction pointer to the next instruction, sorry, and we'll start executing it, right? And that's in the loop. Very, very simple. Yeah. yeah you said uh, you have a different uh, instruction set. So how, how, how to decide where is the next instruction? Right. So the question is, if uh, instructions have different size, how can we decide uh, the size of the current instruction? So who knows the answer? You can tell me. Anyone? Right, correct. So this instruction itself is in some specific encoding. And one part of it is an opcode. Sometimes there is a prefix, an ugly thing of x86. But anyway, so this too and like some bits of it will say, okay, they're, they're unique. You know, you say like by reading this opcode, I know that, you know, this instruction is of a specific size, right? On MIPS, all instructions were the same size. It's a good design choice, to be honest. X86 just ran out of space and they decided, okay, look. I mean, there are multiple design choices here. They thought, okay, first, maybe the code itself will be more compact because if your average was less than four bytes, then you're winning over MIPS, right? But in practice, that doesn't help that much. So in practice, you know, instructions size of Instructions of the same size is probably a good design choice. Easier to do many, many different things, right? But this opcode can, can tell you. Uh, okay, cool. So now our goal today is to understand a subset of this x86 assembly. Specifically, the reason I teach it, and I, I had this version of this class a couple of times where I didn't have this lecture. And then, you know, I just assume that you know it, and I don't know how many people know assembly or have some experience with assembly. That's very good. So like uh, like almost half, I would say. But I didn't want the other half to suffer. And plus, it takes me maybe one or maybe one and a half lectures to cover the core ideas of this instruction set, right? And I will just do the very core part because then we, we're going to read parts of assembly. And I, I don't think you will ever have to modify assembly in this class, but maybe you will have to add one or two assembly instructions to do something like a system call, right? But we will have to read it because when you boot into your kernel, you can't start from, C. I mean, technically speaking, you probably can be very, very careful and start with C, but sometimes you need control and you will, you will implement some parts of the kernel in assembly. Okay, so this lecture is based on those uh, uh, two sources. One is from the uh, University of Virginia by David Evans, and another is from Yale, uh, which is essentially same lecture but uh, slightly different encoding of the instruction set. But so if you if you have any questions, you just click on one of those links, and we'll, they will be assigned as reading as well. A couple of notes. First, we're gonna look at the thirty-two bit version of this instruction set because we're gonna be working with a thirty-two bit version of X with six. It's a little bit uh, archaic as well because we moved to 64-bit machines. Uh, however, like the book which uh, MIT guys wrote covers the 32-bit version, and we we have a port of XV6 which runs on 64 bits, but we decided we didn't have time to update the book. So, and MIT moved to RISC. They decided, okay, we're going to teach a RISC version. I didn't want to do that because introducing yet another instruction set. You have, you know, Kate x86, uh, and now you have to understand risk as well. It gets a little complicated. So we stick with 32-bit uh, version. And they are largely similar, but if you want to really know the difference, you have to take a look. And I will I will talk a little bit of uh, about how what's the, what the differences are when they are becoming important. So there is a couple of tricks which 64-bit version improved over 32-bit version. Uh, 
and we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it. Again, similar to this POS extender, x86 is large and complex. So good luck to you uh, understanding everything. everything. You know, good luck to you building a disassembler or anything that works with real machine instructions. It's, it's hard. So there are so many corner cases, uh, doable, but you will, yeah, you really have to love it, right? But in our case, we have this wonderful observation that similar to this X with six uh, system call interface, the core of this instruction set, which you have to understand, the reason about majority of the programs is very simple, right? Mm -hmm. And we will cover this core, right? At a high level, there are three main groups of instructions, right? One is involved in data movement. So essentially copying data from memory or moving data from memory into registers and back, and also just moving uh, data between registers, right? Then the core of it is arithmetic operations, second part, like addition, subtraction, division, multiplication, right? So not surprise. And the last part is everything what allows you to implement control flow, essentially jumps, function calls, right? So that will allow you to encode if the now statements, loops, and stuff like that, right? Okay, let's start with the first one. First of all, so again, x86 has a ton of registers, probably around 200s easily if you start counting. There is a good blog post online which says, okay, like let's count all the registers because like it's a good it's a good exercise, you know, good homework. Count all the x86 registers. You will not finish in one semester, I bet, because you have to read the Intel manual. But again, the very core is very, very simple. We only have eight. So they call general registers, and there are only eight of them. There are 32-bit each, right? They have special names on x86. It's a little unusual because one would prefer them to be called register one, register two, register three, because normally they don't have any special meaning. But, you know, back in the days, they had some. So they are called... Uh, the 32-bit ver versions have this E letter. It stands for extended because x86 is so old that it was originally 8-bit, then 16-bit, and then 32-bit, and now 64-bit. So 64-bit registers are actually called R, R-A-X, for example, instead of E, right? A really extended, yeah. Uh, and... Uh, so their names are EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX, ESI, EDI. This has a special meaning, ESP. SP stands for stack pointer. EBP, yeah, base pointer. We'll explain why they can be used as general registers, but they usually have a designated role. That's why those names are slightly more important. And again, if you wanna, some of those registers allow you to say, look, I actually, you can actually say, you mean only the lower 16 bits with just AX, BX or CX, or really you can even say uh, a high and a low for those eight and eight bits. Again, that happens rarely. Just wanted to make sure that we understand that how they are named. So only eight, not many, right? Easy. If I ask you, what are those registers? Where are they sitting relative to? Yeah, so they are on the CPU. So what I wanted to like make sure everyone understands is that like in my diagrams, we had two things like DRAM banks, which looks like this. I don't know if anyone updated their memory. When I was a kid, that was a dream, you know, for Christmas, I wanted just a DRAM bank just to play more games or whatever. <laughs> uh, they were expensive. But now you buy a laptop, you, they are actually soldered, so you can't even update them. So like, you know, for a while I was buying laptops which allow updates, memory updates. Now I gave up at this point. And they charge you a lot because uh, like, uh, but sorry, so there is like any CPU. So again, when I was a kid, we were like dreaming about getting a new model of a CPU, swapping it, running faster things, right? And internally those things, if you were in some architecture class, they implement this pipeline, right? So remember clock, each clock will allow you to execute a bit of logic, like for example, this, and then you save the intermediate result in something what is called a latch register, right? It allows you to synchronize those stages between the clock cycles, right? And those registers, they are sitting somewhere over here. They're like tiny memory, which is very, very fast. So remember register read allows you to read 
those couple of those registers into this intermediate latch. And then in the next cycle, you will do an actual addition on this ALEU, right? And the pipelines, they you know, can run out of order, stuff like that, right? Doesn't matter to our, uh, doesn't matter to us in this class, right? But this, this is where the registers are sitting. And this is where the memory is sitting, right? And there is a bus connecting them, right? And there is like some logic attached to this pipeline, which allows you to read memory, right? Read and write memory, right? Okay, cool. So, okay, so let's take a look at those data movement instructions. So essentially first set, we'll be using the following notation, right? So when I will be introducing each of these uh, instructions, I will put something like this. And it means that instruction can take or operate on any of the, uh, any of the general registers and specifically on a 32, all 32 bits of this register, right? So any of this, this one is a 16-bit version. So it only takes a subset of them, those 16-bit. Only four of them allow those naming. Like this is a 8-bit register, and this is just any register at all, any of this, right? Mem, it means that it will operate on memory, right? And there is like possibility of, that instructions can take constant values as well, right? They will just feed them in this. Like you say, opcode, and there will be space for a constant, which you can put there as well. Okay, so first set, move instructions, will allow you to move uh, data from memory into a register and back or from register to a register. So for example, move instruction can operate on two registers, right? Or it can operate on a register and a memory, right? Or it can operate like, like depending on which encoding you use, it can either, like, let's talk in it in a second, move from memory to a register or back from register to a memory, right? Or it can load a constant into a register or it can maybe load a constant into memory, right? Okay, so a couple of examples here. So in my class, there are two, again, this is a little unusual. There is one single encoding which CPU understands, but for humans, they came up with two different human readable and re representations. One is called Intel, another is called AT&T. The most confusing part about those two encodings is that those arguments are flipped in Intel A and AT&T. So I'm using Intel, but get ready to occasionally see AT&T encoding as well, because I think X 6 uses an AT&T. The reason I'm using Intel, because I think it's encoding is a little bit Friendlier. It's easier to read, right? But typically all the tools like debuggers, these assemblers, they can produce either for you, right? So here we what we do is we are uh, so remember Intel, sorry. Uh, Intel encoding. So here we copying the value of EBX into EAX, right? So direction is this one, this way. This is how Intel decided it. And ATT would write it actually move EBX into EAX plus some additional symbols here. But so the like reverse order, that's very confusing. I apologize for that. Okay, like this is it, right? So, okay. So remember that move can operate on a memory value or a memory address. So here we say, we're gonna use memory at location var and put five there. And we actually put it as a byte. Right, so only like using only one byte. So here, this means that we move four bytes in memory uh, at the address contained in EBX into the register EAX, right? So what it means is that imagine you have my wonderful memory, right? EBX contains some value, which the machine will use as an address. And whatever is contained at this address, maybe this is 55, will be moved into the register EAX. Agree? Yes. Okay. Uh, let me just erase everything. Uh, here we reverse separation. Move the whatever value is there in the register EBX into the memory location pointed by this address var, right? And actually, in this case, it's a constant, right? Because yeah. there is no register, right? So it, like we know this, somehow we know this address up front, right? 
So here you can also do a trick. So for example, you say move four bytes at a memory address ESI, which is just yet another register, plus minus four, right? So you can do like a tiny computation of an address here, right? And you move this from this address into EAX, right? Here, the reverse operations essentially. CL, move a byte into this memory address contained by in, uh, memory address, which is computed as ESI plus EAX. Okay. Any questions about it? Good. Very easy. Okay. I'll take it slow. Uh, probably times to stop. So we're going to try to finish the instruction set next time. Uh, and then we'll move on to how functions are called. So essentially, we're going to uh, talk about stack and stuff uh, probably next week.